Wish I had my Spider-Man shirt, but it is dirty. So this is what I'm wearing instead. What was that? It's nothing, I don't believe in that. Hi, my name is Summer. Welcome back to my channel. Today, we are going to be skipping. Hi, my name is Summer. Welcome back to my channel. And today we are going to be discussing. Wow, it was hard for me to say that. Hi, my name is Summer. Welcome back to my channel. And what I, mm, there's a train. There's a midnight train a coming. It's rolling around the bend. And I ain't seen the sunshine since I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know, men. <laughs> okay. Hi, my name is Summer. Welcome back to my channel. No. We're going to let the night train pass. Okay. Hi, my name is Summer. Welcome back to my channel. Today I want to talk about superhero stuff. And um, to begin, I'd like to give you some dates. I'd like to give you some times. First, Batman Forever, that's the Jim Carrey one, came out when I was two years old, okay? I remember when I was little, three-ish specifically, sitting in my kitchen pretending that I'd been kidnapped, waiting specifically for Robin to come save me because baby Summer only had eyes for Chris O'Donnell. All right, years passed, and now Spider-Man, the 2002 one, the Tobey Maguire classic came out. I was nine years old. So a lot of years have passed in my life. Since then, I have watched many, 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 many superhero movies, and I've been, I've been watching them, okay? I've been formulating opinions on them. Also, I've been percolating everything I'm about to say here. You could say my entire life has been leading up to this moment. Let's dive in, shall we? So we begin not with any 90s Batman movies, nor any Spider-Men. No, instead we're going to start with Man of Steel, because Man of Steel is where everything started to go wrong. You see, up until Man of Steel, I'd just been having a nice time in general. I was, it was mostly just the movies for me. I wasn't a comic book girl. I did, however, check out the superhero encyclopedia from the library <laughs> twice and just get a general overview about what was going on in the books. But most of what I was getting about superheroes was from the movies that, that, that were coming out. And we were getting some good movies. You know, Val Kilmer led to George Clooney, Tommy Lee Jones and Jim Carrey led to Uma Thurman and Arnold, Schwar Arnold, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Arnold Schwarzenegger. That was not easy for me to say, but I will tell you when I was writing this out, I spelled Schwarzenegger right on the first try. I was very proud of myself. Spider-Man led to Spider-Man 2, which led to the fever dream that was Spider-Man 3, Iron Man, the X-Men, the Eric Bana Hulk, Batman Begins, Superman Returns. They swept over me. They carried me with them like Moses in his little baby basket, whither where they would. And it wasn't until Tony Stark showed up at the end of The Incredible Hulk that I even realized that these worlds could collide. And it was something I'd wanted for a while, but I thought was impossible. So just imagine pfft, the way my tiny little baby brain was blowing up in that moment. I didn't even know about end credit scenes until I was babysitting one day and I'd forgotten to turn the movie off while I cleaned up lunch or something. And all of a sudden somebody was talking and Professor X, who we thought was dead, was suddenly still alive. Like I was like, hold on, you're telling me there's more movie after the movie? So it was, I, you know, a lot was happening in that time. 2008 was a crazy year for for superhero movies. The Dark Knight came out and altered the course of my life forever. I saw that thing three times in theaters. And let me tell you, people were looking at me weird when I was finally starting to laugh at the pencil trick like it was a joke. Hulk was followed by Thor, which was followed by Captain America. And suddenly I was at the end of my college freshman year and the Avengers was doing something that no one had ever seen a franchise do before. While at the same time, Christopher Nolan's Batman movies were wrapping up with The Dark Knight Rises. All of that, all of those years, all of those movies, the highs were astoundingly high, The Dark Knight, the Avengers and the Lowe's were, we all saw the Green Lantern and we saw what that was. So, but it wasn't until I'd seen Man of Steel that I was like, oh no, these can be bad. Because Man of Steel begins what I call the dark ages because everything is dark on the screen and all, and all the movies are blue. You get it. We all get it. It's a good joke. Thanks. <laughs> There are several things wrong with Man of Steel. Thing one, casting Amy Adams as Lois Lane. I love Amy Adams. I think she's a great actress. I, I like her in almost every other movie I've seen her in, but I don't like 
whoever's decision and authority it was to not have her hair be dark. Like, if it was Amy Adams and she didn't want to dye her hair, I wish they would have given her a wig. If it was the person in charge of costuming and they said, no, no, she can just have red hair. It really doesn't matter. I wish they would have made a different decision there. Because the thing is, I feel like the most iconic comic redhead is Mary Jane, right? And that's that's Spider-Man. That's, that's Marvel. And then you have Lois Lane. And Lois Lane has dark hair. We all know this. We all know this to be true. Lois Lane has dark hair. And the fact that they just didn't, she didn't even try, it just made me feel like I was watching Superman fall in love with Amy Adams and Amy Adams charming and beautiful. So of course he would fall in love with her. But it wasn't Superman and Lois Lane. And that, it took me right out of the story. I was like, what am I watching here? Am I watching the sequel to Enchanted? No, I'm watching Man of Steel. Thing two, it was long. And I can handle a long movie. I made it through Lord of the Rings Return of the King in theaters when I was 10 without needing a bathroom break. So I could have handled that. The length of it was not the issue. The issue was that it had three ending battles. There were three separate battles in that movie that had all the story beats of a final battle. And when Superman was victorious at the end of those, I thought surely the next few minutes of the movie will be everything wrapping up, tying up the loose ends. And suddenly, somehow, there was still more movie and then another battle and then that ended. And I was like, okay, so now everything's gonna wrap up. And then there was still more movie. How was there still so much movie when the movie had ended two battles ago? That was the thing. They were pacing them like final battles and then just continuing on the camera never stopped rolling. So that brings us to thing four. No. And that brings us to thing three, the property damage. The property damage was excessive in Man of Steel. And like, yeah, you know, hospitals are gonna get blown up, cars are gonna get crumbled, a building might get some structural damage. That comes part and parcel with the whole superhero deal. That's what we expect. But this was the first time I'd ever watched a superhero movie and had the actual property damage remove me from the world of the story. Instead of being like, whoa, crazy, look at these crazy strong people flying around and just punching through walls and stuff. I was like, oh great heavens, this is going to cost so much money to fix. And the worst part was, was Spider-Man was not even there. <laughs> And on top of how distracting the amount of property damage was, there was the fact that Spider-Man was party to the property damage. It wasn't like with the Riddler in the Batman blowing up a whole bunch of streets. Batman was doing his best to stop that. Superman was in a bout of fisticuffs with Zod. Like he was part of it. He was bringing the buildings down too. And like these buildings were being turned into rubble. Metropolis was razed to the ground. The economy in shambles thousands without a home. And I'm like, we should have ended this two battles ago. I've been saying this for a while and now the streets are riddled with the innocent. Okay, like it just was too much. And then thing four, the final thing is that this movie suffered terribly from the Nolan curse. <laughs> Christopher Nolan had created something very, 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 very beautiful and very, 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 very good with his Dark Knight trilogy. I love that trilogy. It's my favorite. It's my favorite and I love it. He had created a Batman movie that felt grounded. It felt real. Like gone were the neon antics of Joel Schumacher and Tim Burton. No more holy rusted metal, Batman. The island, it's all made of holy rusted metal. <laughs> I love that part so much. Oh, no more. <laughs> Oh, man. Okay. No. Oh, I gotta calm down, Summer. Bring it down. Okay. There was no holy rusted metal, Batman. The ground, it's all metal. It's full of holes, you know? No puns. No spandex. It was, dare I say, and I'm sorry I have to say, dark and gritty. But Batman lends himself to being dark and gritty. He is vengeance. He is the knight. And most importantly, he has no powers. His powers are being very, very rich and a little bit insane. And Nolan grounded these Batman movies by making them a crime thriller, like mysteries, which works because Batman is the world's greatest detective. Superman is not like that. 
For one thing, he has superpowers. He's an alien. He's super strong. He can fly. He is, just through flight alone, already leaps and bounds more whimsical than Batman. Yes, whimsy is what this man has. Also, Superman is good. He is the archetype of a good hero. He is not an anti-hero like Batman. His battles are not supposed to be with his demons, but against the dark things in the world. He is just a very, very strong guy with a good heart who decided to use that strength to help people. But because of the success of the Nolan trilogy, DC thought everything had to be dark and gritty. They said, everybody made fun of us for the 90s movies and everybody loved the Dark Knight. So clearly we were doing something right there. And what I have to say is that everybody made fun of the 90s Batman Batman because you put nipples on the bat suit. But those movies were camp. We were laughing at them because they were funny. Holy rested metal Batman. We were enjoying ourselves. Everybody loved The Dark Knight because it was a beautifully crafted film. It was dark and gritty as a byproduct of its fitting story, not because being dark and gritty was its main attribute. And that was the fatal flaw that DC started making. Everything from there on out had to be dark, including the Boy Scout, including my boy soups. And actually, I don't have a very strong opinion on Superman. My two main superheroes are Spider-Man and Batman. Superman, I have always been able to kind of take or leave, but recently I've seen some slideshows on TikTok that have some panels from some of his comics, and they have legitimately brought me to tears because they've been so sweet, and he is so kind and a good, character and just like inherently good and I like to see that and it's I think we're all getting tired of trying to twist a good character into a dark evil character at least a lot of us are from the opinion I've been seeing on my side of the internet <laughs> but instead of showcasing his goodness they had him snap Zod's neck which was just a moment I don't think any of us really enjoyed and then they spent Batman v Superman being like oh no he's too strong what if he what if he turns evil And unfortunately, that brings me to Batman v Superman. Oh, no. Oh. I can say nothing about the Martha Martha Deus. I can say nothing about the Martha Martha. I can say nothing about the Martha Martha Deus Ex Machina that has not already been said. That was simply a cherry on an already cherry riddled cake. The thing is, they were desperate to catch up to Marvel, which had already released its second Avengers movie at this point, and they really wanted to get Justice League started. So to do that, they started taking shortcuts. They said, listen, <laughs> everybody knows Batman. Everybody knows his backstory. We do not need to make another Batman movie in order to get Justice League started. But they didn't commit to that. Instead, they squeezed a Batman origin story, pearls and all, into what was a Superman sequel. And you see, the thing that had made Marvel as successful as it was at that point was that they had taken the time to build the foundation for their cinematic universe. They spent four years releasing the five movies they needed to in order to introduce all of the characters for Avengers. Each hero got at least one movie, Iron Man got two, but in the second Iron Man movie, we were introduced to Black Widow. So by the time the Avengers released, we were familiar with all of the players. DC only took one year and eight months between the release of Batman v Superman in March of 2016 and the Justice League in November of 2017. In the intervening time, they released the first Suicide Squad, which had no bearing on the Justice League movie, and they released Wonder Woman, which was wonderful, and I loved it, and more on her later. However, when Justice League hit theaters, there were three members of the squad we'd never even met yet. Aquaman wouldn't get his own movie until 2018, Cyborg still hasn't gotten his own movie, and who knows what's gonna happen with Flash at this point. And the story suffered because of it. At this point, I was also rapidly becoming disenchanted with everything that DC was putting out, which sucked because I loved Batman, and I don't know if I would have gone to see Justice League in theaters, or if I even would have seen Justice League at all, if my roommate hadn't managed to get tickets to be seat fillers at the red carpet premiere, which were free, by the way, which was really neat. We just had to wait in the big line. Like the coolest things I can say about the Justice League movie was that I got to see it in the same room as Gal Gadot 
and Jason Momoa and the guy who played Cyborg. Like, like I was in the same room as all the famous people, which was cool. And then on top of that, it was a neat experience to go to that premiere because you had all the people who had worked on the movie in that room. So when people's names would come up on screen, and I'm not talking like the main, you know, the big celebrity names, I'm talking all the names, people would like clap and cheer when they saw themselves or when they saw their friends. So that was really neat. And then also the premiere itself was at the same theater where they do the Oscars. And as I was coming out of the bathroom at one point, I opened the door and I almost bumped into somebody. And that somebody was Liza Koshy from Vine. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry. And she was like, oh, I'm sorry. And then we walked past each other. And that was neat because I recognized her from Vine. But as you can see, none of those things are about the movie itself. And that's because I didn't like the movie itself. The biggest crime that Justice League committed, in my opinion, was its treatment of the Amazons. And in particular, Wonder Woman. Now, I loved Wonder Woman when it came out. And I'm not saying it's the greatest superhero movie that's ever been seen on the screen, but I really, really enjoyed it at the time. It was charming. It had good characters. It let itself be sincere. And it really blew me away, especially in the fight scenes, in how respectfully the camera captured Diana. I remember watching some behind the scenes contents afterwards and looking at the detail and the hard work and craft that went into making the armor for the Amazons. They studied ancient Roman armor. It just was like, there was a lot of thought and effort put into creating these costumes for the Amazons and see the study and craft and care that went into it to turn around and watch Justice League and suddenly they're all just in leather bras. What's protecting their organs? Who's to say whatever CGI monster isn't going to come around with a big sword or a big claw and just rip them open? They have nothing protecting their soft underbellies. What good is a leather bralette in the heat of battle? It's no good. Run. You're going to get stabbed. I hate it. I hate it. Oh. And what I loved about Wonder Woman was that she was, when she was fighting, she was strong and, but the camera wasn't focusing on like her butt or her boobs. It was just on her being cool. And I just, I'd never seen fight scenes like that in this kind of movie when it comes to women. And it was just real neat. It was just neat. So it struck me as so much worse when watching Justice League and we've got all the Amazons in their leather bras and we get this really long tracking shot where the camera's following Wonder Woman as she walks into the room to, you know, go talk with the rest of the Justice League. But the camera is centered on her butt and her leather skirt has been significantly shortened from Wonder Woman. Because I remember, I remember being like, wow, look, her skirt's even long enough that you don't see her little underwear unless she's like high kicking. And then all of a sudden we've got a camera and we've got cheeks. And I just was like, good Gracious, let it end. Oh, I haven't watched the Snyder Cut. And I don't know if I ever, I don't know if I have, though, I don't know if I have it inside me to watch the Snyder Cut. Anyway, let me move past and go back to two points I made previously. One, Batman's origin story being shoehorned into a Superman sequel. And two, Wonder Woman being allowed to be sincere. Because now we're going to start in on Marvel. All this time that DC was disappointing me, Marvel had on the whole, been hitting it out of the park. But unfortunately, much like a park you have been in too many times, you start to get familiar with the layout. These bad boys were starting to get formulaic. I was still having fun. I was still enjoying myself, but let me give you a little anecdote. I saw the movie Big Hero 6 in theaters with my roommates from college. I had not timed my beverage intake correctly that day. So to my shame, I had to go to the bathroom in the middle of the movie and while trying to figure out the best time to dip out of the theater, I said, the battle is important. I must stay for the battle. I can leave right at the end of it. And surely as they are just recovering from the heat of battle, I won't miss anything but a little bit of conversation. So I was gone and back in 60 seconds. I remember I was counting, I was power walking and I was there. I left and came back in 60 seconds. And in that 60 seconds, something happened. I haven't seen Big Hero 6 again. I, to this day, I don't know what was so devastating that the entire theater was crying, including my roommate who almost never cried. And if you're thinking, oh my gosh, did you miss that moment? Yeah, 
I probably did miss that moment, but I don't know. And that made me realize a few years later when I was watching Doctor Strange and again had timed my beverage intake incorrectly and I had to go to the bathroom, I said, I cannot do to myself what I did in Big Hero 6. I'm going to leave instead during the battle because you know what? Nothing's actually gonna happen during the battle except they're going to keep punching each other. The big important thing will happen at the end of the battle. So I did, I left during the big mirror fight and then I came back just in time for the emotional heart of the film. And after that, I don't know if it was just the nature of the movies themselves, if my eyes had been open to the formula, but somehow the movies were all starting to look the same. We all know it. And I, I, I mean, Marvel and DC movies, so many of them, Suicide Squad, Avengers, Age of Ultron, Thor The Dark World, on and on and on, all of these movies were suddenly about defeating some big beam of light that was shooting into the sky or a big hole in the sky that a bunch of aliens were coming out of or a big wicked magic tower of light that was turning everybody into like evil bubble people. The main battle was starting to look the same over and over and over again. So around that time, when Wonder Woman was coming out and Thor Ragnarok was coming out, I read an article or a review that introduced me to the concept of Bathus humor. Let me make sure I said that correctly. Bathus pronunciation. I can't see nothing because I'm not wearing in my glasses. Bathos. 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 I wanted to say batho bathos, but it's bathos. An article that introduced me to the concept of bathos humor. Bathos. Bathos humor. Bathos is defined as an effect of anticlimax created by an unintentional lapse in mood from the sublime to the trivial or ridiculous. I wish I was wearing my glasses right now. The words are blurry and it is making me realize how bad my eyesight is, but as you can see, you'd be able to read the whole script before I said it, so I have to take them off. Anyway, it's been years since I've read that article. I did try to find the one that I read around that time, but when I looked up Bathus Humor, Thor Ragnarok, there was already like three articles where people were specifically talking about the Bathus Humor in Thor. But to paraphrase what it said, it was basically this. Think about the ending of Thor Ragnarok. Asgard is gone. Thor's people are now refugees floating through space. Thor has taken on the mantle of kingship because his father is dead. It is a solemn moment. Many people have died along the course of this film. But instead of ending on that note, that note of like a little solemn, a little sad, but still hopeful for the future, it ends with a silly little joke. Bathus, lofty sentiments, high stakes, and then, oh, Minx? Yeah, Minx is dead. I accidentally crushed him on the bridge, but I felt bad, so I've been carrying him around. Oh, Binks, you're alive. Now, Ragnarok was a comedy, so it worked in that case, but the thing was, that sort of humor was starting to take over the entire MCU. So hard moments weren't often allowed to land, and if they were allowed to land, they weren't given very much time to settle. Instead, being quickly followed by a joke, or a quip, or a one line. It could be a delicate balance, because sometimes the comedy was effective, but too much of it risked taking away the foundations that the story was built on. Unrelated, I hear that waiting until the end of the video to say, oh, remember to subscribe, doesn't really work anymore. So I'm sticking this request here, subscribe. Okay, back to the story. So on one hand, you've got DC misguidedly burrowing deeper and deeper into the dark and gritty mines, hoping that eventually they might strike gold again, strike gold like they did with Nolan, but they wouldn't strike gold again, not until the Batman. And the only reason the Batman worked was because it again understood that Batman, the character, could be grounded in reality, and it gave us another crime thriller. And then, on the other hand, so he, DC, with his shovels, and over here, you've got Marvel, and Marvel is getting brighter and brighter and more reliant on CGI, especially as more and more of the movies take place in space, and it's riddled with this Bathus humor, which is sacrificing the moments where the stakes felt the most serious for a quip or a one-liner. And again, like I said, sometimes it was effective, like in the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie, and sometimes the story suffered for it, like in Thor Love and Thunder. And I think what it comes down to is the quintessential superhero movie is anchored by its serious moments. It's the life and death stakes, the choices the hero has to make. And it's buoyed by its moment of hope, its victories, and yes, its moments of humor. And when it's done right, 
you have something that is really well balanced. But if you go too far one way, as DC has for a long while, the anchor starts dragging the story down. But if you go too far the other way, the victories start to feel hollow and meaningless. Because there are no real stakes to anchor it. Now, one of the reasons Wonder Woman worked so well, and this is a point from that article that I referenced earlier, is that it let Diana be sincere. It let her moments land. It let her unapologetically and a little cheesily win her battle by realizing that her love for humanity, for her friends, for the people she'd helped along the way was more powerful than the despair and rage of war. She didn't spend too much time fighting her own inner demons. She wasn't too busy making quips. She instead said, love is what matters here. And she stuck to it. And I respect that movie for it. Meanwhile, the newest Spider-Man trilogy was kind of hitting that same note over on Marvel's end. We were seeing a lot of Spider-Man in the MCU, but it was really in his main trilogy that he got to shine of course, but we were getting battles that felt grounded and comedy that was working because much like the way that the Dark Knight was rooted in reality because it made itself a crime thriller, the comedy worked for these because they were being presented as like a classic 80s teen movie, John Hughes, Ferris Bueller, or Pretty in Pink, but Ferris Bueller has superpowers and Molly Ringwald's dad has a big pair of scary wings and also used to be Batman. But I think one of the most powerful things that the MCU did for this version of Spider-Man was they gave him room to grow. Batfleck had his origin story in Batman v Superman, and we knew nothing about that version of Batman. What led him to become the man he was today? We caught sight of a Robin costume that said ha 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 on it. And of course we got the, you know, the pearls in the alley scene, but we didn't know anything about that Batman. Similarly, Marvel, dropped Spider-Man into Captain America Civil War and said, hey, guess what? You all know who Spider-Man is. We've done this song and dance at least twice, so you are not getting a third time. There you go. And just like with the Batman origin story and Batman v Superman, this did bother me a little bit. Because for me, if you are introducing a character and he's brand new to this iteration of the story, and this version of that character is in no way related is in no way related to past versions of himself. It's not an actor change. It is a new character being introduced into the story. We have to act like he does not exist outside of the parameters of this tale. We need to see how this character fits into this world, even if it's only briefly, in order to give us a chance to connect with that character before he joins forces with all these other superheroes. So you've got Batman v Superman that gave us a brief origin, but no time to connect with this character at all. And then you've got Spider-Man in the MCU where we were given plenty of time to connect, but no origin. We saw him in Civil War. Then we saw him in Homecoming. Then we saw him in Avengers Infinity War, in Avengers Endgame, in Spider-Man Far From Home. We were getting a lot of time with Spider-Man, despite the fact that we had never received an origin. I have never had a better movie going experience either before or since Spider-Man No Way Home. And I went by myself. I was seated between strangers in a completely full theater and it still, there was so much camaraderie. We were all clapping and cheering when Toby and Andrew showed back up on screen when we got to see their Spider-Man, got to see them be Peter Parker with Tom Holland. And we were all doing so because we'd been invested for so long. For me, it had been a full 21 years watching these movies. I'd been there since the beginning elementary school, middle school, high school, college. So many different times and aspects of my life have been peppered with the excitement of getting to go see these movies. And then to suddenly have all three Spider-Men in one movie going all the way back to the very beginning was so cool. I loved it. But even better than that, I think one of my favorite things about Spider-Man No Way Home was realizing that all of Spider-Man's entries in the MCU, from Civil War to No Way Home, were Spider-Man's origin. Marvel hadn't just decided not to give him one. They hadn't said that it wasn't important. The whole arc was his origin story. We, you know, we had this epic battle with William Defoe as the Green Goblin, which was, oh, chef's kiss, very beautifully done. And we see Aunt May, she's broken, she's wounded. And all of a sudden she's talking about great power and the great responsibility that comes from it. We realize it hits us like a ton of bricks that Aunt May is our Uncle Ben in this scenario. 
And to see it happen when we thought we were in the clear, when we thought we weren't getting an origin story, when we thought we just skipped that most crucial part of Spider-Man's backstory, him losing that steady pillar in his life. And to have it happen in the, th at the near the end of the third movie was just beautifully done. I have no words. And in those Spider-Man movies, we were getting those moments of sincerity at the same way that Wonder Woman was giving us moments of sincerity. And that's where we've been for a while. DC sitting in the dark, Marvel amongst the stars with the occasional entry here and there that manages to achieve a good stasis. With Birds of Prey and the sequel to The Suicide Squad and The Batman, we got to see some really strong DC movies that seemed to have achieved that balance. And it seems like they're getting a better grasp on how to portray their characters. The, the Nolan curse is lifting. And then in recent Marvel entries, you've got the Spider-Man movies, Black Panther, and you have WandaVision that are kind of hitting those same solid notes. And WandaVision did really great until Multiverse, until Multiverse of Madness undid the, every good thing that WandaVision had done. WandaVision had been such a beautiful study of grief and loss, and it curated within the viewer a deep sense of sympathy for Wanda. And I watched, the sec I watched that show just before I watched Multiverse of Madness, and it just made Multiverse of Madness feel like a slap in the face because they didn't do they brought none of the character development and none of the story that had been so lovingly crafted in WandaVision into Multiverse of Madness. Within moments of seeing Wanda, she's evil. And then from that point on, she's just evil and it's all CGI. And it's like, oh, look, isn't it scary? Because, oh, what, the graphics are like spooky? Yeah, no, that's not what makes a horror movie. <sighs> There was no depth, there was no finesse, and I feel like the movie could have been vastly improved if they would have given her even a moment to descend into madness on screen. Because where the audience had left off with Wanda as a character was her vowing to find her children. But she was still in kind of like a hopeful place. She was still in a good spot mentally. <laughs> And to have within moments of her arriving on screen, her just be evil, it was a disservice to all the time that was spent with WandaVision. It would have just been an improvement if we got her at the beginning sincerely trying to help Doctor Strange. She's struggling against the effects of the Darkhold, but she's still trying to be good. And then if she could have met America Chavez, seen what her power was, realized how she could use that power for her own to finally find her children again and have her wrestle with that and then finally dip down into madness and do whatever needed to be done to harness that power. That would have been so much more effective than just being like, hey, do you remember this character that we spent 10 weeks making you fall in love with and making you feel really a lot of sympathy for and making, you know, you really see her side of the story and you feel really bad for her all the time and she's, and you want her to succeed and you want her to do well in life and you just want her to be a little bit happy because all she ever has in the DC, in the MCU is just sadness all the time every day of her life. Yes, also she's evil now. Be scared of her. I just, oh, it was exhausting and I didn't like it. Oh, and like this movie was supposed to be built as horror, but it had no, it had no sense of suspense. It had no eeriness. It just was spooky like CGI graphics. And that doesn't do it for me. That didn't strike fear into my heart at all. I went to that movie and I was sitting there in the theater and I checked back in with myself halfway through and I was like, how are we doing, Summer? How are we feeling about things? I realized my arms were completely crossed. I was sitting like this and my face was like this. I was like, oh, the crossed arms, the furrowed brow. Oh, we're not having a good time. I was not having a good time in that movie. And I don't think it helped anything that I had seen everything everywhere all at once, literally the day before. And then I was comparing the beauty of two rocks with googly eyes making me weep versus <sighs> Multiverse of Madness. And it didn't do it any favors. Anyway, that was a tangent. I wish they had taken Multiverse of Madness in a different direction. But here we are, off we go into the future and we wait to see what this next season of superhero movies will bring. My parting thoughts are find the balance, understand the character, and maybe in another 20 years, I'll have more thoughts on this subject. Goodbye.